different time of year, can you tell? <laughs> welcome to Lutheran Church of Christ the King, where we celebrate the love and forgiveness of Jesus as we welcome sinners and serve the vulnerable. I am Pastor Megan. I am so happy to see you all today. I invite you to stand as you are comfortable. <clears throat> On this day of the resurrection of Jesus, we rejoice that through his death on the cross, Jesus has delivered us from the power of death. And we do have some paper stones available for our wall, if you would like to describe how you will be rejoicing on this day. The peace of our Lord be with you all. And also with you. I invite you to share a sign of peace with those around you. Hold up those peace signs. Share peace in the comments of our Facebook or YouTube sections. Peace, y'all. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. In the waters of baptism, we have passed over from death to life with Jesus Christ, and we are a new creation. For this saving mystery and for this water, let us bless God who was, who is, and who is to come. We thank you, God, for your river of life flowing freely from your throne, through the earth, through the city, through every living thing. You rescued Noah and his family from the flood. You opened wide the sea for the Israelites. Now in these waters you flood us with mercy, and our sin is drowned forever. You opened the gate of righteousness, and we pass safely through. In Jesus Christ, you calm and trouble the waters. You nourish us and enclose us in safety. You call us forth and send us out. In lush and barren places, you are with us. You have become our salvation. Now breathe upon this water and awaken your church once more. Claim us again as your beloved and holy people. Quench our thirst, cleanse our hearts, wipe away every tear. To you, our beginning and our end, our shepherd and lamb, be honor, glory, praise, and thanksgiving, now and forever. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. reading from us Isaiah, the 65th chapter. I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people no more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it, or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days, or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall bring long joy to the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offsprings blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food, shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
reading from Acts 10. Peter began to speak to the people. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testified about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Thanks be to God, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as you are comfortable for our gospel affirmation. Mm -hmm. So 
So when I talk about this story, when I talk about Jesus' story, what always stands out to me the most is that Jesus, throughout the Gospels, tells his disciples, tells anyone who will listen, really, what's going to happen. He tells them over and over again on the third day, on the third day, he tells them over and over again that the Son of Man will suffer, will die. And throughout all of this, the disciples rarely believe him, right? They kind of just assume this is part of his dramatic rhetoric for his preaching and teaching. And so even as he is sitting down with the outcasts, as he's healing, as he's pointing to this holy week, that we observe as a church, it's really interesting that when the worst part of the story happens, when the Son of Man is killed, the apostles, the witnesses to the trauma, all of his followers sort of forgot the ending. As the remaining 11 disciples and other followers are gathered alone in a house to grieve, the women go to do their work. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and some other women, whoever they might be, went to conclude the story of Jesus by finally preparing his body. They brought their spices with them, grieving the ending that they didn't see coming. And then their story changes, because as they arrive at the tomb, the stone is rolled away. And Seeing this, they think, oh, maybe someone's helping us by having the stone moved so that way we can go and prepare the body since we weren't able to do that. And so they go into the tomb and there's nothing there. It's empty. And I imagine them frantically searching, like picking up cloths, looking underneath any kind of stones, wondering what this new twist in the story could mean. Perplexed, confused, I wonder if they ask themselves, how? How could this happen? And then suddenly there's these two guys in dazzling clothes like angels standing in front of them. If you're in a group of women and you're inside a cave that you expected to have a dead body in and there was not a dead body, and now there's two random guys appearing out of nowhere, yeah, I'd be terrified too, so I don't blame them for this. Their terror is also awe. They're amazed at what they're seeing, and before they can even say anything, the angels say to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you. Remember how he told you. They're telling the women that they know this story. They're living it. Sometimes we forget the important stories we've been told, whether it's because of grief, anger, sorrow, or the realities of trauma in our lives. We forget, we can even change what we remember, right? The human memory is very flawed. And for the disciples, for these women who were followers of Jesus, their memories had left them, as it does for us sometimes, too. But when the women hear these words, remember how, that was all it took. Sometimes it takes someone else to help us remember our stories. When we face grief or sorrow, we need someone else to help us remember how that person we lost laughed. When we're facing trauma or a broken heart, having someone say, remember how many people are there for you, you're not alone. When faced with all the twists and turns that our life story might take, sometimes having someone simply say, remember that you are loved, can help you find just a slow breath, help you find your place. Now for Mary and Joanna and Mary, all the women who were with them, this moment of remembering reminded them that this wasn't just Jesus's story. It was their story too. Their story of this son, this divine person who walked with them, who died in front of them, whose tomb was empty, 
And so they returned to the 11 disciples and the rest, and they told their story. And like so often happens when people on the margins share their stories or their experiences, they were immediately dismissed. These words seemed to them an idle tale, gossip, make-believe. The women can't handle their grief or their emotions. The Greek word here that is used to describe idle tale is... Well, it's a curse word that is very similar to baloney, if you catch my drift. Garbage. I wonder if one of the disciples was thinking, yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Or, yeah, okay, I'm sure that's what you saw, okay. I think that we know those kinds of experiences, trying to tell our stories, trying to listen to other stories, but failing to do so. And... It's a pretty common reaction to faith stuff, too. The story of Jesus' death and resurrection, what it means for us, sometimes it's hard for us to even get the words out for what that means for us as an individual. But also, I've been in those disciples' shoes. Most of you know that for most of my life, I thought of Jesus and faith as a really nice story. I found myself attending Easter Sunday worship with my mom out of Obligation and often bribery. Bribery works. <laughs> I would just be waiting for the pastor to stop talking, wondering why the Wi-Fi was so bad, or how many doodles I could fit into a single bulletin. And if that's you today, it's okay. We're glad you're here. If that's you every Sunday, we're still glad you're here. It's okay. I promise your secret's safe with me. But I would listen to the sermon, watching the people around me, and I would think, oh, isn't that nice? It's in our nature to dismiss the stories and experiences that don't perfectly match up with our own. As a whole, in our society and in our churches, we fail to listen with believing ears to those who share experiences filled with hard truths. We struggle to hear experiences from people who are different from us, whether that's because of their gender, orientation, race, or ethnicity, background, and especially sometimes age. For the disciples, it's hard, it's a hard truth that their story isn't over yet, which should be good news. It should be good news that these women are able to share this story. But I wonder if they thought, if Jesus really did rise from the dead, why would the women be first? Why would they be the first to know? Why didn't Jesus come talk to one of the disciples? Why didn't he come talk to Peter? Why didn't these angels show up for us? And whatever reason they found to dismiss the women's testimony, still stories have power and purpose and meaning. And at least one of the disciples heard the women because Peter does go to find out what's going on. Maybe it's because he really believed the story that these women were sharing. Maybe it's because he remembered just how accurate Jesus' prediction of his own betrayal had been. And maybe started to remember that Jesus had told them over and over again about this three-day stuff. Maybe Peter was just desperate to change his own story as the failed disciple. Whatever the reason. The truth of the women's words got Peter up and running, stooping in and looking inside an empty tomb, terrified, amazed, in awe of what he found. And as Peter goes on to share this story, this experience of life and death and new life with Jesus, we find him in our reading from Acts, preaching to Gentiles. Because, like many stories, Jesus' story was being made into something it was never meant to be. His upside-down kingdom of the poor and the meek, of the outcasts and the marginalized, was being turned into something that was only for a few. The early church was drawing a line in the sand and saying that if you weren't this way, if you didn't convert to the old laws, if your life story didn't match up quite the way we wanted it to with ours, then Jesus' story wasn't for you. And Peter goes to those who thought maybe Jesus wasn't for them, and he tells them the story of Jesus. 
He says, I truly understand that God shows no partiality. This God who made us, who made all people, is for all people. Every nation, every person who finds awe in God, who does what is right, has a valuable story to God. God, through Jesus, is a story of peace, a story of one God for all and of all. And that message wasn't just for one group or one area or one people, but it traveled. The story of Jesus' anointing and baptism The story of his care and healing, of God's presence with Jesus through all of it. His death and his resurrection were not just for a few. And God chose the followers of Jesus who would be least likely to be believed to be the first witness to the empty tomb. The first to tell the story. We are all made up of these stories. And those women, Mary, Joanna, Mary, and all the rest, are part of our story too. And sometimes when we forget, when we forget the ending, when we forget Jesus' words, when we forget the stories and experiences that shape us or that matter to us, like an amnesia that comes over us, sometimes we need to be reminded to remember how we're not alone, to remember how loved we are, Sometimes we ignore the important stories that are shared with us by others. We dismiss them as garbage or baloney, as idle tales, because we can't understand them yet. We see it as not for us, not representing us, not part of our faith story, and so therefore not acceptable. Sometimes we take the stories of faith of our own lives or of the lives of others, and we twist them into something they were never meant to be. Sometimes we fail to listen and welcome those in our lives who most need our care. And sometimes we don't even realize how harmful our words or actions can be. But today, on Easter Sunday, as we celebrate Jesus' resurrection, all of us are reminded of the importance of our stories, our experiences, and the grace and love and promise that is flowing throughout them. We are reminded that in Jesus' story, we too have a place. It's not just the women who discovered the empty tomb. It's not just Peter. It's not just the early church. It's our story, your story, my story, God's story. The God who cares for us, who wants to share in our stories with us. And when the Son of God faces the cross, for you and for me and for all people. When Jesus takes on our failures, our selective amnesia, our dismissiveness, our tendencies to twist and turn stories, all of that garbage that we carry, Jesus leaves behind an empty tomb with a new story, a new hope, a new life. And so we get to celebrate Because our story continues with Jesus. And maybe that's in sharing in Jesus' ministry, doing good and providing healing for others. Maybe it's just in sharing your own story, your own experiences, even if you might get dismissed or ignored or worse, knowing that God is still present there with you. Maybe it's in telling Jesus' story and why it matters to you. And maybe today the part you play is simply one of celebration and gratitude for the power and purpose and gift of an empty tomb. Christ is risen. He is is risen risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God.
and professing our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. On this day of resurrection joy, let us offer our prayers for ourselves, our neighbors, and our world. Renewing God, the good news of your resurrection changed the world. Give church leaders and all the baptized the same excitement as the women at the tomb and inspire us to share your abundant life. Merciful God, receive our prayers. Sustaining God, your creation abounds with signs of new life in budding trees and newborn creatures. Provide fertile soil, ample sunlight, and nourishing rain for the growth of plants, and provide farmers with a plentiful harvest. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Sheltering God, strengthen and sustain all who support vulnerable people across the world. Empower government agencies and international organizations that provide for refugees and migrants forced to leave their homelands. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Encouraging God, you do a new thing among us. We pray for those gripped by fear and anxiety or who suffer in any way. Send us as your healing presence to places of hunger, pain, illness, or overwhelming sorrow. Merciful God, Receive our prayer. Surprising God, you offer endless ways for us to delight in your grace. Give this community of faith a sense of joy and wonder in exploring new avenues of faith formation, worship, and discipleship. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Today, especially, we pray for Dutch and Carol Fries, Janice Graham, Earl and Roxine Gratzer, Don and Jen Phelps, Judy Vig, Patty Westney, Dick Abadell, Monica McFadden's family and friends and their grieving, Sharon and John Hauser, Walter Sieplick, Carol Morrell, Kathy McCurdy Patrick, Sherry Mace, Doug and Debbie Oakman, Gina Sieplick, and Cindy Scarvold. At this time, I invite all of you gathered here by the Holy Spirit and even technology through our online worship to lift your own prayers, petitions, and thanksgivings to our Lord. You may say them aloud, hold them silently in your heart. At this time, for what do the people of God pray for today? my friend sister Vicki who is uh, nearing the end of her life Lord we pray for peace and comfort for her in this time and for her family surrounding her merciful God receive our prayer Resurrecting God, you make us alive in Christ. 
Thank you for blessing us with faithful witnesses who now rest in you. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We offer to you these petitions and those we carry in our hearts, trusting in your abundant and ever-present mercy. Amen. Indeed, 
write our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who is dying and, ha and who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, with cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs>
heaven and earth, where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection, that through our lives all may know life in Jesus' name. Amen. God, the author of life, Christ, the living cornerstone and the life-giving spirit of adoption, bless now and forever.
while you're in your car. It's kind of a quick and easy way to give them some really necessary items so they can come back. And, and I need people to sign up for helping me with lecturing and flowers and all sorts of stuff. So I'll put it on the table here. You can sign up for the week to come. I appreciate it. Wonderful. Well, with that, I will ask you one last time this morning to stand as you are coming. Happy Easter, everybody.